Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, we have with us today, as you see, uh, Mr. Abhinandan Malik, who is from the EBC Learning. Uh, Eastern Book Company, I know you all have heard about. Very many good books which you have in your library are from EBC Publisher. And as I understand, they are one of the oldest law publishers. We also have uh, Mr. Pradyuman. And of course, today's speaker, Dr. Charu Mathur, who is an advocate of the Court Supreme Court of India. Uh, Ms. Swati, who has coordinated everything. Uh, faculty members, Dr. Garima, Prachi, Uma, Sanya, and all. Um, I think many of them are here. So, as you know, uh, today when we are here, uh, it's a, of course, it's an important and very, very interesting lecture which will be uh, taken by Dr. Charu Mathur. But before that, I just want to apprise you that uh, we, that the School of Law, Bennett University and EBC Learning are launching, we have an MOU with uh, EBC Learning and in this uh, common banner of Law School, Bennett University, and EBC Learning, we are bringing you a program, Mastery Certificate of Advanced Corporate Law. And uh, this will be a six-month, uh, uh, very, very intensive and up course, of course, offline, and which a law student who are here can take parallelly also, because classes will go on in the afternoon. However, it is open to uh, not only to the people who are studying here or right, right now students, but even to the past law graduates, uh, management and engineering students. And uh, it is actually a very important, uh, in, even the professionals who are senior professionals, advisors, managers, and everybody is interested in attending this specialized up-screen course. So, uh, this will be actually uh, uh, help the students in their career, you know, those who are interested in the corporate uh, practice or being the corporate professional uh, um, uh, or in any other way they want to be associated with corporate uh, uh, forms or being the corporate practitioner. So, today, uh, you know, this course probably will start July. We will have the beginning in July and it's a six-month certificate course uh, with regard to all other uh, details, be it what will be the curriculum, what will be the mode of evaluation of, for you, what all other things will be shared with you. We have uh, people from Benet uh, sorry, uh, uh, EBC and then ultimately with regard to the uh, subject matter we have with us Dr. Charu Mathur. Uh, presently, she is an AOR as well as she has lots of diverse and rich expertise in corporate, commercial, civil, criminal, and constitutional law matter. So, she will be speaking to you for uh, around one and a half hour, maybe, and then uh, you will understand more about uh, why or how you should take this course. And not necessarily all of you are sitting here. But those who are interested, those who want to up the skill those who want to upgrade their knowledge, and we will have, I mean, here you will have a different type of classrooms if any one of you take admission, because there will be many people, it will be open to everybody. It will not be open to any benefit school, a law school, it can be engineering uh, management student from outside also. They can be professionals also. I mean, you will have your classmate who may be 55 years old. Uh, so, I hope that will be a different type of experience. So, with these words, I congratulate uh, both Bennett because now we have entered into this agreement and this is final from the university side. We should give a big round of applause to this. <laughs> I will request uh, Mr. Abhinandan Malik, who is from the EBC. Uh, he's the, you know, uh, person from the real Malik family. He's Abhinandan Malik. So, Malik will put some, uh, you know, uh, light on the whole thing because it is his brainchild. And the world does with this, we like the idea and to live here. Thank you. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you, ma'am. Thank you for this very kind uh, introduction. Uh, 
Um, and welcome everyone. Uh, it's great to be here and it's great that the EBC has partnered with Bennett University to bring you this course. Uh, as uh, you all know, we are again from the EBC and uh, I don't know how many of you are, you're familiar now with the new logo of EBC of course. So um, I'll just go into a little background about EBC itself, uh, right? Um, so of course you are familiar with uh, SCC, Supreme Court cases, and uh, as you know, EBC has been bringing right from, they have a very long history, we've been bringing you revolutionary products right from the beginning. SCC started in 1969, uh, uh, Mr. Suleyn Malik, uh, he's actually my uncle, he's the one who started SCC. Uh, then, of course, you have the complete digest. I don't know how many of you are aware that the digesting system that you have for case law today was again introduced by EBC and by the SEC. So, this is the SEC digest actually digests the complete law of the country. So, to be able to, uh, to, be able to uh, create this digest, the complete law of EBC, of sorry, of SEC was gone through, and then each judgment, each head, each entry was curated so that you can look up the entire case law of the country through an indexing system. Then of course you are familiar with SEC online. Here again we revolutionized legal research and how legal research came about. We have the EBC web store where again you have access to all of EBC publications and other publications on law, any topic on law, you can come here and you can have access to that. EBC then of course went on to create the EBC Reader, which is our ebook platform. Again, how you access ebooks, this is a revolutionary tool that is unparalleled, that is an unparalleled tool today. You have the SEC law itself, which uh, I don't know how many of you follow, most of you must be. Uh, that brings you the latest in news, updates, then, of course, the EBC books. A lot of you may be familiar. I've just put together a few uh, names here that most of you, uh, you may be aware of. So, Club Constitution incidentally started in 1950, and that's how back it goes. And then, of course, you're aware of uh, Pepani CPC, a practicing contract and criminal procedure. Amongst the, I mean, there are, of course, uh, probably some 600 or 1,000 plus titles of uh, EBC. Now, but we are just a few to uh, that. I, will, I mean, most students would probably be uh, familiar with. Then, of course, there's the EBC Learning, sorry, the EBC Explorer product, which extends the physical book to the online space where you can access, access judgments and updates for particular books. Then, of course, you have EBC Learning, which is what we are here uh, for today. EBC Learning started in uh, 2000. Uh, 18 now, where we had brought in uh, your self paced courses. Here you have the self paced courses, and these are modules, so an entire library of courses that you can just subscribe to and take on your own uh, self pace. So, what next? As you've already, I mean, the cat is out of the bag already. So, we have introduced the EBC Learning Bennett University Mastery Certificate on advanced corporate law. And this particular course is like no other that you have uh, seen. Uh, the entire course includes 70 plus live on-campus lectures. So the lectures themselves would happen here on campus. Then it includes, of course, all the recordings of all these lectures will be provided to you. You have as part of this 17 self-paced courses on each particular aspect in corporate law. So you have these additional video materials that is about 550 videos, five, more than 550 videos as supplementary material that is provided to you as part of this course. This is all of course in addition to the 70 plus classes that you would have. About 500 MCQ assignments. 15 ebooks and barracks that you would get, in fact, more than 15 now. So, this uh, that you would get from the EBC Learning, uh, sorry, the EBC Reader platform would provide you access to all these publications during the course. 
of course, a hundred plus cases that again through the click of a button you can access on SCC online. And then of course we have, in the end of the course, you get the mastery certificate and of course you get a recommendation letter based on your performance uh, during the course. And then in the end we also then provide 100% placement assistance. That means we have tied up with placement partners, law firms, where we will introduce you to these particular law firms and help you get placed. And that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll now uh, pass the next follow up to Dr. Chandu Mathur, who will introduce you to one of the subjects uh, that we will be covering in corporate law. So, this is going to be a very preliminary and introductory class. I don't know how many of you have studied insolvency law. So, this is just a little bit about the class, and then towards the end, we will go through the syllabus a little more. Uh, Mr. Pradeep would uh, take that on towards the end and show you the entire syllabus of the course and what we will be covering and we'll talk a little more. Uh, Dr. Chatmut. Good afternoon everyone. Uh, good afternoon ma'am. It's a pleasure to be here and I'm uh, great to talk to you. So today I will be just introducing you insolvency and bankruptcy laws to you. It is uh, one of the foremost courses that have come, one of the foremost law which has come and as a young professional, I see that you have a great future in this particular law if you take. Now, before I start and explain you about Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code 2016, I would just like to give you a brief background about uh, why this law was needed. So, you know, you must have heard about NPAs, yeah, non-performing assets of the bank. So, before IBC or Insolvency and Bankruptcy Court, there was SICA, right? SICA was a Sick Industries Act. Now, what used to happen that if I am a corporate, I take a lot of money from the bank, I use for my own pleasure, putting little in my industry and I default and I don't pay. Still, bank will run after me, please pay me money, please pay me money. I will be keep sitting in my AC room, chilling out, that usko paisa lena hai, so they will be running after me. Now, there was something known as BIFR, right? If you go to BIFR and if you take a stay from recovery, not even gods can get money recovered from you. It had an appellate authority, AIFR. If you get a confirmation of stay, then for your next two, three generation, you were safe. So, I am not saying this, but Mr. Arun Jaitley, as he was the finance minister, he said on the floor of the parliament, that if you get stay from BIFR, nobody, you never ever have to repay the money to the bank. So what all this has led to a great national problem. So they decided that we need to do something. I don't know if you have heard the name of Professor NL Mitra. He was second vice chancellor of NLS Bangalore. Then he was a vice chancellor, first vice chancellor of NLU Jodhpur, which is my hometown. And he was the person who was doing the study about the banking laws. And when he studied, he found this lacuna, but it was very slow paced. When in 2014, this government came, the new regime had came after UPA 1, UPA 2, you have this present government, they realized that this problem was going overhead. So within in one year, under the then cabinet secretary who retired, uh, they made out this committee and within the period of 8 months, this law was up and running. They made the forum as NCLT, National Company Law Tribunal as the adjudicating authority for insolvency and bankruptcy court. Now to start with, RBI came out with a list which commonly we call it as Dirty Dozen. So it had list of 12 companies which were the topmost defaulters. So you had companies like JP Group was there, JP Infratech, which though doing wonderful work, you won't find such a beautiful highway anywhere else in the country, but it was in default. It started F1 here also. Lot many housing projects were there. Then you had SR Group, right? SR's Ruya, nobody could have ever thought that somebody could touch them for their default. That company got sold. Now Rivoya has no more control as our thanks only to this insolvency and bankruptcy code of India. So before this code came into being, it was a fragmented, you had certain provision for uh, recovery of debt from individuals, certain way to take it from the partnership. 
it was very scattered. So this is a code. When I, why don't I say it as an act? Why do I call it code? The reason being, it codify everything related to that particular aspect of law into one place. So for all your insolvency and bankruptcy things, you go to this code. You follow this code. Now once this code was there, it gave something very different. It was a paradigm shift from debtor, the debtor who was in the possession of the project. So from debtor in possession, we moved to creditor in control. So now instead of banks running after the industrialists, banks say we seize this, this is our property, you get out, you are in suspended animation, you sit out, let us see if this can function. And remember the objectives of IBC is that money should come back in circulation in the market, in the system. If I take a loan of 1000 crores and I don't repay that money get blocked, right? I am a bad management, I can't do anything. So you need to churn it and money must come. It is not that banks have stopped giving loan. They want to give it to far more people, far more ambitious, far more risky projects. But idea is that you should have the people in management who can actually be productive, who can return that money, who can take country to the greater heights. So it is not a recovery, it is not a civil court, right? Where you go and file a suit for recovery. It is, idea is to maximize the realization of the asset value of the company. Now, this one court, it has made the huge difference in the ease of doing business. You know, this is this index comes out, how friendly a country is to do a business. So this one court made India jump almost 60 places. Yeah, this is a country where as a foreign investor, I'll go, I will not be struck, I will be good. So this is one thing that has helped. Then you need to remember that in this case, NCAT is the adjudicating authority and NCLAT, National Company Law Appellate Tribunal, is the appellate authority. Up till now, NCLAT had only one bench that is at Delhi, but now it has one more at Chennai. So, uh, uh, incidentally, on the EBC learning in 2016, this act had come, I think in 2018 only we launched, or 2016, December it had come, uh, before it became functional, our first edition on the essentials of insolvency and bankruptcy board is there. So, what I suggest you, and uh, in sin all sincerity, that you must go and watch that course, it is to give you a difference. Insolvency and bankruptcy means two terms, very different meaning. Go and explore what does it mean, right? And likewise, we will be talking about operational and financial creditors as I'll come uh, to that. So that is one course that will give you a clear understanding. It will give you a concept of not every debt is recoverable. Only there is something which has got time essence of value. Because they say that money, if you keep it just like that, if you don't make your money to work, in future, its value will be different. So, what you could buy for 100 rupees today, after 5 years, you won't be able to buy. Until and unless you make your money work. So, whatever loan, like if I take, somebody has given me loan out of love and affection, that won't be recoverable under this. But if it is a pure commercial activity, even if it is from my father, he has given it as a commercial loan to me, then that can be recovered. Now, uh, this is a single insolvency and bankruptcy framework which enables for the commercial solution. So now even when I do a business, I have to assure that this is a business which will be fruitful. If I don't perform, I have a sword hanging on my head, then government will come or some creditor will come, take me to NCLAT or NCLT and my business will be taken away from me. So, you are under pressure to perform, right? You cannot say, Ki la, yeah, it's my father's shop, so I will sit around say. You have to work hard to make your business succeed. Now, if there is a genuine business failure, see, not every business succeeds, not every idea succeeds. So, it gives you a fair second chance also, right? It gives you a chance to present a resolution plan, how you can go ahead with it further. And if, when you will do the course, you will realize how to draw the resolution plan and how to draw the information memorandum. Like it has got a beautiful architecture. If you ask me, uh, then this is one code which gives you a lot of 
See why do people not succeed because the information is not shared equally. Earlier banks were having or the corporate data that is the company default was having much more information than I as a creditor might be having. This act removes this information asymmetry. It provides the same level of information to everyone. So that is one more reason for its success. And another reason which I will give you is there are very strict timelines. Defect act, remove in 7 days. It is to be listed in 14 days. There are certain things which are mandatory, certain things which are directory. And as a student, what I suggest is that more you learn it, more you read about it, it will be very beneficial for you in the long term in your careers. Now, uh, I will just introduce you quickly uh, to the various players in this. One is corporate debtor. Debtor, as you know, is somebody who owes debt, right? So, the corporate debtor is a person who is a defaulter, right? So, we call it corporate debtor. This is the terminology which you should be familiar with. Then you have got financial creditor. Financial creditors are like your banks, right? Where you have taken a finance and then you are not able to repay them. So, they are financial creditors and then you have got operational creditors from which you take goods and services. So, tomorrow if you don't pay for your Airtel bill, Airtel can come and sue you that these people are using that but they are not giving me uh, pay card dues. Likewise, if there is a contractor who has supplied you say cement and you don't pay, then he can drag you to the uh, under the insolvency and bankruptcy code. Now, before pandemic, the threshold for this was very low. It was only a default of 1 lakh rupees. So, huge number of operational creditors, they used to take the corporate debtors to the NCLT and it has actually become an arm twisting rule. You pay or you become a bankrupt or we declare you insolvent. Your business will be taken away. But post pandemic, they have made it a limit of 1 crore rupees as the default. Only then you can take it to the NCLT. Thereafter, you have IRP or Insolvency Resolution Professional and this is where I suggest you where you have your career prospects. Right? You have your great career prospects as IRP. Remember, IRP is an individual but an individual cannot manage the company of a magnitude of SR or JP in front end. So, that person always works with a team. Right? If you take example of JP Infratech, its IRP was Anuj Jain, but he was I think from KPMG. So, the entire team of KPMG was there, there were lawyers, there were CAs, there were CS. So, they were telling him what to do, how to collate the data and everything. Then you have the resolution professional. IRP itself become resolution professional if the committee of creditors so decide. We will be following it as and when we come to these authorities. Then uh, in this ecosystem, if I tell you, you have got adjudicating authority which is NCLT. Then you have appellate tribunal, I have told you NCLAT. Then appeal from NCLAT goes directly to the Supreme Court. It does not go to a high court or anywhere. So it directly goes to Supreme Court. And then there is something known as information utility. Now this is very nice thing. In this, like if a company is there and I take a loan, I create a charge on my say, my building and I take a loan of 100 crores, I put this building uh, against this building. So, all the financial banks, all the financial transaction that you do, you have to register it with information utility. Right now, we have got only one. It is government NSEA does that. So, it is the, where all the information is there. Right now it is not so much, eventually it is hoped that entire database will be there and there will be zero information asymmetry. I can log in and I can see that this company can means these charges are there. Right now also, if you are interested in corporate law, I suggest you go and explore Ministry of Corporate Affairs website. You can get a lot of information there. In one of our courses on IBC practical filing, I have told you how you can get the information. 
I have explained it from the perspective of a lawyer. As a young lawyer, if you join some chamber, they will ask you to, Are JP Infratech has come, uska CIM kya hai? First you will think, what is the CIM? Right? So, corporate identification number, how to find it? So, all that I have explained you that it is there, you have to just click find, get the master database, you will get these are the charges against this company, this is the loan amount they have taken. So, just explore this, explore our courses also, you will get to learn quite a lot. And then you have got IPA. IPA is your Insolvency Professional Association. Right now you have got CS, CS and ICW and ICAMI which operate. So once you clear this insolvency exam, thereafter you have to register with one of these bodies and then finally you become an IRP. Now IRPs, if you get some good projects and even some okay project, then also you earn lot of money. Much more than what you will be earning in an entire year working in a law firm. If you are an IRP, you will earn that in one single project. Much more than that. Right? But for that you have to be prepared. Now, how do we start all this? Right? So, there are three routes which are provided under the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code. There is something known as CIRP, that is Corporate Insolvency Resolution Process. So what does CIRP do? We find there is a problem how to resolve it. It is not saying R is not for recovery, R is for resolution. There is a problem how do we resolve it. So first it can be initiated by OC which is your operational creditor. So how do you initiate it? You first send them a demand notice saying that this is the amount that is due, these are the invoices, please pay within 10 days, otherwise I will drag you to NCLT. If he pays, fine. If he doesn't pay, if he says that there is already a dispute pending before an arbitrator or a matter is pending before the court, then they will say, fine, we will not do anything, then we cannot drag you because it is already placed before some forum. Then, this is done under section 8 of the code and thereafter you file a petition, move an application before the relevant NCLT and go for this operational creditor you file it. Once the NCLT admits it, it does the three things. It appoints an IRP, it issues a moratorium and it asks you for a publication in a newspaper. Public announcement is there. Moratorium means Stop doing everything, give thinking space to the corporate data and help him resolve. So during the period of moratorium, you cannot file any case against the uh, corporate data. You cannot sue or he cannot get sued. He also cannot sue the other party. If there are any proceedings, it comes to complete halt. right? And you get a time to think how to resolve this issue. Then there is a public announcement and in public announcement they tell you that okay fine this company is under the IBC. So whoever has to put their claim please file this claim. So you have to, there is a certain forms given where you have to file as uh, if you are a financial creditor, if you are an operational creditor, if you are a workman, if you are a government and then there are special credit uh, categories like home buyers, right? Because of, they go, home buyers are what? They are technically speaking, they are not providing raw material to build their houses, so they are not operational creditors. They are not providing you loan to build their houses. They are giving you money to build something for them. So, when initially the first case of JP Infra had come, so home buyer said, Where will we go? So, they put them in the residual category. But after subsequent amendment, home buyers are taken as financial creditors. It is a separate class. And there they have given a separate classification that at least 100 home buyers should move. Because cases had come where the entire real estate project has come to a halt because one person has moved to the court saying that stop this process. Only two days back there was a decision by bench of justice uh, Ellen Rao and Justice Gawai where they said that the approach of NCLT and NCLAT was not proper when the builder is saying I will finish off this project within in the period of six months. Please don't do it. So what they have done is they have allowed this uh, 
prayer to complete this project, which according to me is a very sensible one, but that is totally divorce the rules and the code and regulation. Moving on to the financial creditors, your banks, etc., they can take you. Now, financial creditor has got something very powerful. Generally, big companies, they take loan from the consortium of them. See, suppose there is a 1000 crore loan which say SR had to take. So, not ICICI won't give 1000 crore to one entity. So, what they will do? 250 from HDSG, 250 from SBI, 250 from this and that and they make this. So, in financial creditor, if I am ICICI bank, there is no default on for my part of loan. But that person is defaulted on SBI loan. So even as ICICI bank, I can take them to court and say declare them as insolvent. The idea is before the companies fall into the stress of uh, this financial distress, you should try to remedy it out. Right now company is facing us, they are not able to service 250 crore ka loan of SBI. Tomorrow they will not be able to service 350 crore loan of mine. So what I have to do? Before that situation comes to me, I take them to NCLT and we try to resolve this. And the third is that corporate applicant. Sometimes corporate debtor also know I won't be able to pay. So they say, Ki, please declare me as an insolvent. <coughs> Liquidate my company and whatever is there, distribute because I have defaulted. There is a specific definition of corporate applicant under the course. You can again visit our course and you can have a look. Now, you can have a vast career as insolvency resolution professional. So, right now the path for you is little difficult because it requires lawyers to be of at least 10 years of practice, CSCS or 15 years of practice. But there is a way out. Government of India under the Ministry of Corporate Affairs has come out with a program called Graduate Insolvency Program where only people under the age of 28 years can be part of that. And it is an expensive course, I think 10 lakh rupees per annum is the fees. It is a two years intensive course on IRP, becoming an IRP. And you take that course, it is a highly competitive course. You take this, you become IRP and you will be one of the youngest. So lot of, lot many people are doing very well who have taken this route also. But even if you don't get this rule, yet what you can do is, as I have told you, IRP is an individual, but he cannot function individually, right? So he always requires a team. Likewise, for a lawyer or a law firm, they also require a team. I just give you a small example. Uh, again, I have given in our practical filing exam course. See, you have to fill in the details. Ki itti default thi, itti default thi, itti default thi. And if it is not meticulously changed, instead of 523, if you write 532, entire thing goes wrong. There, where they require your help to see that everything is filled properly. You have to check where is the registered address. You have to look for large case laws also. Now, cross-border insolvency is also triggering in group insolvency is there. Then there are pre-packs which are coming. So it is an ongoing developing field. So what I suggest you is, this is the one area where you can have a niche over your peer, right? So even from your career perspective, insolvency and bankruptcy court read in tandem with uh, company law along with your RBI regulations and SEBI regulations, it will be highly beneficial for your career. And then of course you have got uh, as a liquidator and valuer. For valuer, they have a separate exam. So if somebody is from the accounts background, somebody can understand the numbers. So being a valuer is also a very important component that you value the company. What is the value of the assets when you liquidate it? How do you distribute it amongst the various uh, other people? So you have this as a, uh, another career option as insolvency profession. Now, I think uh, this is all from me regarding the insolvency and the bankruptcy court. Lot many judgments have come from the Supreme Court. If you want to read one judgment, I suggest you read Swiss Ribbons uh, judgment by the Supreme Court. It is just 
Merriman's judgment is this Renta uh, Merriman's judgment and it will give you the entire background of IPC. And one of the earliest decision was of innovative industries versus ICICI Bank. These are the two cases that I recommend you read irrespective of uh, whether you want to pursue career in insolvency or so on. And now I think I will pass uh, that to Pradyum to explain about the course. Good afternoon everyone, uh, my name is Pradyum, I am associated with uh, EBC Learning and uh, as you are now well aware about the course that uh, we have sort of launched today and uh, we will be conducting our classes from 11th of July uh, this year. So I am basically here to talk you through the syllabus, the pedagogy, how we have curated this course, what all we are covering and why it is completely uh, for your benefit only and for the other people who will be subscribing outside the university. So the basic uh, two tenets or the two pillars uh, at EBC Learning or any of the courses that we do um, uh, is that the hallmark is number one is the rigor that all our courses are quite rigorous and the second is comprehensive. It doesn't, so what we are trying to say here is that it doesn't matter that from what level of learning that you are. Everyone, some of you may be uh, first year students. So uh, depending upon at which level of learning you are at, right, so that uh, absolutely is not a bother, right, because uh, the course that we are bringing you will take you from the basic to all, uh, you know, to the advanced level. So when we call it as a mastery certificate, what we actually mean here is to provide an absolute mastery over the content, right? And generally in a law school setup or otherwise as well when you are trying to learn the subject from the bare act, etc. What do you get? You generally get a basic understanding of the subject and then maybe you may have read up on some important case laws that are important and then most likely in your examinations you try to apply those case laws and sections to fact problem and that is it right and many of you may have realized by this time when you are going to your internships it's a completely different experience right and so that means the reading of law or as one of my professors used to call it as the doing of law is a completely different experience right so what we bring through this course is that bridge of reading the law and doing the law right and that is very important right so we take you from an elementary level of just knowing and understanding the law and all the way of all the practical things that needs to be done. For example, Dr. Mathur was talking about uh, all the paper uh, work that needs to be done, how it needs to be filed, right? So all of those are practical processes or pretty much I can say your bread and butter when you'll be working at a law firm, right? Most of the times when you, uh, I don't know about you, but when I sort of, look at a law office or uh, been there as a law student myself a few years ago, right, I would find that it's a very disorienting experience that uh, whatever you have studied in the, in the classroom is a completely different ballgame altogether, right. So with this course, we're trying to bridge that entire experience. So what this course gives you is sort of uh, not only the replication, but something more than what you actually learn um, at an internship, right? Rather than, let's say, going, uh, working at a law firm and asking for internships and asking questions, okay, how this needs to be done, right? You pretty much would have hands-on training while doing this course and learning and understanding, okay, how a particular thing needs to be done, right? So now I'll quickly, you know, run through all the 74, 75 sessions that we have planned and uh, would give you a basic idea about what all things you are going to learn and how it is going to benefit you as a career, uh, benefit you as a student as well as a working corporate law professionals at a law firm or not only at a law firm if you decided to join as an in-house counsel, if you decided to work for a bank, uh, if you decided to work for a big four in some form of consultancy. So how uh, all of it would, you know, this course would you know, lead you for the next big thing in your life, right? So, uh, we start here with some sort of a basic uh, understanding for uh, 
for legal methods or some sort of a corporate law method class uh, to orient a lot of students who will be joining uh, not from law background but even if you are from a law background sometimes we do get our basics wrong or perhaps we don't have that quick acumen to you know apply our basics whenever we want to you know what a bear act is you know how to use an SEC right but how do you use it quickly fast enough you know in, in the crunch timing right so you can understand the you know the uh, a particular matter is listed right and a thing needs to be done let's say within half an hour right or something came up at 8 p.m next morning is the hearing when you are really burning your midnight oil working at a law firm or with your independent practice how to do things fast enough right how to navigate the law is one of the important things that you learn so even when you graduate I mean, one essential skill that you graduate from a law school is try to understand that what is where it's not important to know all law right but it's most important to know where law is present so if you can hear your client's problem right when a client's coming to you and talking to you and then if you can quickly navigate even within your head that okay this is where the legal solution lies right this is like pretty much half of your law degree done there right so trying to sort of build on the foundation that okay these are the things that are important so if you say corporate law what all is necessary the bear acts the you know the rules the regulations uh, looking at the safety master circulars uh, looking at the insolvency rules uh, the code right uh, looking at the competition commission of india so what we have put together here is it's sort of a comprehensive course uh, on corporate law touching upon each and every elements of it so it's not just company law right so here we have you know the elementaries of company law the practice of it and along with it you have uh, processing of m a transactions uh, competition law you have uh, uh, insolvency law and to you know end it up with uh, csr right so what you are getting here is some not some sort of a jigsaw but each of these classes as they have planned would flow from one part to another right and there are a lot of things which are ancillary in nature which we are generally not applied in terms of the skill sets which you are expected to but not everyone is sort of great at it or perhaps wouldn't have acquired it you know some of the professionals uh, and this is talking with experience take somewhere around 10 years to master some of the you know basics of accounting right so if you're looking at a corporate problem right corporate law is not just the law right it's also understanding the business right because you're doing business law it's also understanding uh, the numbers it's also as dr mathur uh, rightly pointed out it's also understanding valuation right so all of these becomes an essential skill uh, drafting you know contract drafting people have acquired these skills over 5 years and 10 years of repeatedly doing it so we're going to be having people uh, with enough experience uh, top people who are doing this uh, day in and day out to deliver this course and content to you right on top of it we we'll have people who have written books with ebc for example tarun mathur arman patkar will be taking insider trading so all of these people uh, have established themselves in legal fraternity they are distinguished names that you can you know some sort of a uh, you know legal celebrity status you can just simply google them you'll find a wikipedia page on them right so all of these people are part of this course these would be the faculties uh, who will be taking these uh, sessions right so now i'll quickly go through uh, the important uh, modules or the sub parts and how we are doing it so we'll start with corporate law methods as i discussed and then we'll go to the evolution foundations essential concepts of corporate law right where we are trying to build up uh, some sort of a historical as well as the contemporary sequence that what uh, is at the bottom of things right company law contract law as a series of contract right and then we'll uh, from that sort of a uh, premise we would build on to uh, corporate uh, contract drafting right uh, mr patrinath srinivasan would be taking it he's been you know uh, drafting contracts teaching corporate uh, contracts uh, for more than two decades now right so he will be the facilitator for uh, the corporate contract drafting 
Then we'll come to the choosing of an entity registration and incorporation, where we're trying to look at, okay, fine, you've understood uh, the basics of corporate law, but how to go about it? What sort of an entity you want to register? Do you want to register as a partnership? Do you want to register as a company? Um, how do you go about it, right? So here again, the, all the practical aspect of things are covered. That means, uh, you know, tomorrow if uh, your client comes to you and say that, okay, I want to open a company, right? Uh, any sort of a quick solution, so what would you do? Do you know how to open a company, right? So all of that training, that all the way from registering a company till the processes of winding up or insolvency or even merger control where there are elements from insolvency, merger and competition law would be covered. Now, of course, by the end of the course, you may find uh, some portion as more interesting and relevant and the place where you want to build your career in, right? Not everyone who is doing uh, a competition law practice would do like an insolvency practice or a merger practice. What we're trying to do here is that teach you the basics, along with the basics, all the, you know, the clinical aspect of things, what all filing needs to be done, how they need to be done, where things needs to be downloaded, which form need to be submitted, how it should be, you know, accessed, Right? So all of those aspects are covered. So for example, here you have incorporation of uh, a company. So it's not that we just tell you that, okay, this is how a company needs to be incorporated. But if you want to change the nature of your company and want to incorporate a different uh, a company, for example, uh, you may have started as a non-profit, which is like a Section 8 company. But after a while, you sort of realize that, no, no, this can be something profitable. This is business. This is not charity. Now, how do you, how do you convert that non-profit into a private limited company, right? What is the processes? Which forms needed to be filled in? What needs to be sent at the corporate affairs or to the ROC, right? So all of those things are sort of embedded in this course. And you are learning all of those things not by the, the, uh, that the facilitator is going to come and tell you, okay, you do this, this, this. What is sort of embedded in this course is also the assignments. So it is learning by doing. So all of those things which are sort of communicated to you, so for example, basic you've been taught, okay, this is how you convert a cooperative society into a company. A possible assignment that would be given to you is, okay, can you convert a non-profit into a company, right? So there it's a completely mock-up of all the exercises that you have to do, you know, go through the entire checklist, okay, this, 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 done. These are the, you know, elements that needed to be filed. This is how the articles needs to be changed. What is the nature of it, right? So it is all about practical doing as well as the learning that you have from, you know, uh, the reading on the basics of company law, right? For example, you have a class on the effect of pre-incorporation contract. Let's suppose you just started as a Facebook or a Twitter page, right? And then you entered into some contracts or you are a, micro celebrity on TikTok or an Instagram and then decided to capitalize on something and become something big. I mean, a classic example is Rajni Khan versus CID jokes, right? It started as a page and then it's a full-blown company. Now, you know, things happen. Now, if you entered into contracts with a lot of parties and then how do you go about it? How do you ratify them, right? What is their validity? How you are going to incorporate into the framing of the company? So, I mean, that's the section on uh, choosing the entity. Now, one of the most important things is that uh, a lot of law students, even if you are doing your uh, BBLLB or even BLLB or just a three-year LLB course, the problem is that a lot of people don't know how to look at a balance sheet. They've, they've not seen numbers, right? And as I said before, learning about the business is also not just understanding the sense of the business activity but also you need to you know find out what the number says right so how do you navigate it so we have finbox analytics uh, a top financial firm uh, based in delhi so people from the firm uh, also the partners of the firm would come deliver uh, you know or will be teaching you the basics of accountancy right uh, not so that you will become the masters of it but while you are processing any transaction right you would know which documents to look at and how to find it, right? As a popular Hollywood dialogues go sometimes that when anything is going wrong, uh, 
follow the money or look at the trail of money. So how are you going to look at it, right? So there is a skill to it, there is an art to it, there is a craft to it. So all of that would be the part of this course. Then uh, the, uh, one of the important chunk of the course is uh, raising capital uh, both ways, whether you want to raise capital in forms of uh, private equity or venture capital uh, in the era of startup that we uh, looked in. I mean, just now before the class, just a Google notification tells me about how Zepto has raised 900 million, right? So how all of this is happening, right? So let's say Zepto was your client, right? Uh, what all things need to be done uh, in order to raise that fund? Uh, if that fund is raised, uh, we are also in the era of Shark Tank uh, in terms of trying to understand the, the, the equity market, how it is working, right? So if you are a legal counsel to one of the you know clients, whether it is Jan Shikanji in, in Shark Tank, and what it, what are the compliances that needs to be done, either from one of the sides of the sharks or either from you know from the the, the corporate, right? So you know the classes here or the facilitated would take you through the entire process, right? And not just taking you through the entire process, they would make you do some mock exercises as well. That okay, following company X supposed to raise this much fund. These are the clients, this is where the money is coming from, right? And how do you then work around, how do you process that transaction, right? So all of that is part of what you are supposed to do if you're working at a law firm, right? And this is basically your bread and butter. What generally happens is you may know company law as it is and you may know, understand the rules. What bonus you get here is that how do you apply that, right? So there are three facets of it. So there is your bulk of legislation or even delegated legislation, so the rules, regulations, whatever, so you know where the bare law is written. Then you have judgments on the other side. And the third is the practical side, that how do you sort of merge both of them and actually do uh, process or in some sense push the papers and how you are going to do it, what is the nature of it, what needs to be done, where needs to be filed, how the negotiations happen while negotiations are happening, what all things that needs to be taken care of, right? So that's from the side of the private equity and venture capitalists. On the other hand, if you're going for an IPO, right? Uh, some popular ones, some unpopular ones, for example, you must have seen what has happened with Nika. Uh, you must know what has happened with uh, Paytm. Uh, and let's not talk about LIC, okay? So, uh, the reason is that all of this is happening, you know, in, in terms of the optics, what do you see? There is a gong has been rung and then, you know, some numbers put in, right? But what is that entire process? What's that background that goes into, right? What is how you are going to draft a DRHP, which is draft red herring prospectus, right? What are the important uh, elements and essentials that you are looking at when you are reviewing a DRHP, right? And looking at DRHP not from just one angle, you, you may have to look at the place you are working at. So if you are working for an underwriter, you would have different priorities. You are working as an in-house counsel for the company who is going for the IPO, you have to look at different things. If you are looking at, uh, if you are working at a law firm who is processing that transaction, you perhaps have to look at the different things. Now all of this that you are doing, your fundamentals of contract, your fundamentals of company law, your fundamentals of uh, applying those judgments, keeping that, you know, the array of things in mind becomes very important, right? So this, what we are trying to do here is that bring all of that practical knowledge of processing a particular transaction or any transaction, right? Uh, and making that knowledge available to you. So tomorrow if you are going for an internship or even if you are looking for a job, you can go uh, and ask uh, any of the person or if the person asks that, okay, what do you know? Right? So you can very proudly say that, okay, I know this, these, these, these processes I know, right? And even if you haven't, let's say, processed a transaction, you know how, how the transactions are processed, right? So generally, if you go to a law, for a law firm internship or even as an internship at uh, legal departments of some, uh, you know, company, not much attention is sort of paid because, you know, the associate or the partner or whosoever is in charge of you perhaps has to dedicate some extra time for you to make you understand. And most of them, uh, you know, from my internship experience, lasts only for photocopies or if one of the persons may have 
forgotten to put page numbers. So writing page number 1 to 12,256 may be your job. But that's not the learning that you are having, right? So we bring all the learning as we call EDC learning to you so that you understand all of these uh, nuances, right? Then not just only from the size of the lawyers because also from the size of the, you know, CAS and there would be CAs involved, right? So all of that compliance processes, right? So understanding the litigation bit, understanding the compliance aspect, understanding the law and uh, both in terms of the judgments, in terms of the legislation. Uh, so that, that synchronized energy is sort of the hallmark of the course. Now, similarly for raising capital, we're also looking at debt financing, right, in a similar light. On the other hand, we're also looking at, you know, the, 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 you know, the duties of the directors, things that is, uh, are happening at the managerial level. Uh, many of you may are familiar with a series on uh, Hotstar called Succession, I guess, right? Um, I'm very sure like 80-90% of uh, you wouldn't have understood all the corporate aspect that goes behind it, right? So if you've gone through this course, I think I'm pretty sure you'll get 100% of it, right? The reason being that the transactions have been processed, what are the things that are coming in, right? How they're going for a debt financing, right? How they're looking at a term sheet, how they're going for a shareholder's agreement, right? At the same time, looking at the... Uh, the responsibility of the promoters, looking at the duties of the directors of a company, they're anyway walking on the eggshells, uh, eggshells all the time while looking at various uh, liabilities that they can walk up to. So if you're a legal counsel of a company, your daily job is just to tell the directors of any of the decisions that they are taking or any of the meetings that are happening, that what can be done, what cannot be done, right? Whether a meeting is happening, you're stuck in the traffic, can you have, you, can you be the part of the board meeting? on a phone call, right? And whether that is legal or illegal. So all the fancy things that you may have heard on Boston Legal or on suits or on succession, right? Uh, half of the things if you are going top of your head because that's the bread and butter of a corporate lawyer, uh, learning and the knowledge of it is all here. Right. Then we're also looking at conflicts in corporate form. That's where the things get very interesting. We're trying to look at, uh, you know, differences between majority and minority shareholders. Uh, looking at uh, shareholder litigation, class action, which you may have heard a lot, courtesy, uh, you know, foreign web series. Uh, but that is something now also part of in, in Indian jurisdiction, right? So how do you go about it? Then. Uh, things on accounts, investigation and fraud. So we're trying to actually, you know, simulate. So we may give you like a thousand page problem, right? Where is some, some sort of a fraud that has happened. All you need to do is navigate and find out where the corporate fraud is, right? So by this time you will have understood how to look at uh, the numbers, right? Also, you would have figured out how the business organization and forms work. You need to identify what are the green flags, what are the red flags, how the audits take place, what are the auditors' deliverables, how what is the internal auditor report is coming, external auditor report is coming. You try to see and figure it out whether there was a fraud or not, right? And once that happens, what is the way ahead, right? So the entire background of things, right, and sort of the processing of it, right? Otherwise, if someone comes to you and tell you corporate fraud, very simple, section 447, you are done. But that's not all of it. How do you figure out there's a corporate fraud, right? And how you're sort of involved in the entire process, okay? So, all of those aspects of investigations and looking at things there. Then insolvency and winding up, some sort of a snapshot was given to you by Dr. Uh, Charu about uh, how things would be there. So it would be Dr. Charu who would be taking uh, the insolvency uh, part of things and also uh, we have Abhishek Sharma is also a partner at Link Legal, it's an established firm in Delhi, right? So all the people that we have more than um, 25 instructors to deliver the entire course, each person has specialized in a particular thing and they would uh, be taking you through the entire process. Then we come to last two things which are most important. One is competition economics and law. So sometimes we talk about competition law, something that 
uh, you may be aware of a lot of things that are going on with uh, Amazon Reliance and Future. Uh, for example, also the permission had to be taken uh, when it comes to the Vodafone and the idea uh, we're trying to come together. So it's not only knowing the competition law is not enough, right? Understanding the competition economics is also a greater importance. So as I said earlier, I'm just sort of reinstating it again and again that we build your knowledge all the way from basics. So if you don't know competition, like how it works, the economics of it, right? So we would, you know, go, you know, take you from that process, understanding the nature of competition, how it works in the market, what is the relevant market, right? And then you will be able to uh, master the competition law. Similarly, uh, on the merger side, which is the mother of all unit, right? Because this is where all of it that you have studied before comes together. Most of the work that is happening in the law firm today is related to uh, mergers, right? That means the processing of the transaction. A lot of things that you would have to do as an A0 or as an A1, I don't know how many of you are aware of this lingo which is popularly used in a lot of um, law firms today. A0 means as a fresh graduate you join a law firm as an associate zero, right? Where practically you don't know anything, right? But the point is that you need to be a smarter A0 or a smarter A1 and how do you do it is that all your daily chore at a law firm or anywhere would be due diligence and trying to do that over and over and again. It is basically a process of looking at whether the things are in order or not. What are the documents that are required? Just sort of a check. So making you go through this process or making you do due diligence over and over again through this course with the assignments later. All of these classes would have an assignment attached that is for you to do and learn from them, right? And the feedback would be given to you by uh, the, the faculty and the instructor, right? So here it is just not about the mergers, also about looking at the hostile takeovers, also looking at merger control where the competition law and merger sort of meets together. Also looking at mergers from all aspects, right? From the taxation aspect, you have to look at it. You also have to look at it from the human resource aspect, right? We don't know whether uh, Parag Agarwal is going to be fired from Twitter or not, right? So how that thing is to be taken care of? What is the exit deal process? How uh, all of that things come together once an acquisition has happened, right? What are the legal rules so that there is no liability on any one of the parties? So all of that you will be able to navigate and you will end with uh, corporate social responsibility. That just doesn't mean uh, some sort of an ideal, but actually going, uh, all of you would go through uh, the process of uh, drafting a CSR policy and which is quite a niche area that has developed and a lot of uh, jobs are coming out of the drafting of the CSR policy. This is one of the areas with very uh, it's lucrative, a lot of people, uh, there are less people with the skill sets required and there is a huge demand. Then uh, just to uh, quickly add on the assessment uh, criteria uh, and scheme, uh, we will sort of take you through all uh, the process, all the assignments that you will be submitting whether it's a big assignment or a minor assignment uh, and all the self-paced learning courses uh, that are part of the course. So what you have to do is at the end of the term, you may appear for a VIVA or a written assignment, right? While we also, we, you know, you can choose your uh, area within corporate law and decide to write a paper. Otherwise, uh, the pre and the post class assignments uh, that you would have is that every class that you're going to attend, uh, it's mandatory for you to submit a reading note. So that's how we ensure that you have read, you have watched all the relevant videos, right? So the support system that you have here, it is not just these 74, 75 like classes. As Abhinandan already presented to you that we have more than 550 plus video support. These are small capsules of videos, so make you understand the basics of it, right? For example, if you are going to a class of contract drafting uh, by Mr. Badrina, you have an entire course, pre-recorded course by Mr. Badrina and you would go through that entire course and would learn the basics, right, from the self-learning. 
and then you go to the class and then have your doubts sort of sorted by him, right? So similarly, uh, also at the same time, there would be some pre-class assignments, some of the assignments that you have to do after the class within a particular deadline, or you may have some of the bigger assignments, that means you are given a task to process an entire mergers transaction, right? It may take you to complete a one month, or uh, a bigger assignment on corporate fraud, where you're trying to figure it out uh, in you know small groups, so they can be you know role plays assigned that okay one person becomes uh, part of the internal audit team, the other one is an external auditor, second person becomes uh, maybe the victim, right? And all of uh, you will be able to present to each other and then try to understand all the relevant processes, right? So our idea here in terms of uh, having uh, our idea here of having this assessment criteria is not to judge you uh, in terms of or give you marks or anything. Although we have a higher limit in order to get the mastery certificate, you need to score minimum 75%. That's how we know that you have acquired the mastery over the subject, right? But the idea here is that constant, uh, it's a qualitative assessment and constantly you are given feedbacks upon whatever submissions that you are doing, you can rework on them, better them, right? And on the basis of that, we will be writing a personalized uh, recommendation letter, right? So that you can use it if you want to go for foreign studies or when you're appearing for a law firm interview or any of the jobs that you're in. So we can actually tell them qualitatively that these are the things that, uh, you know, you have accomplished, these are the things that you know, right? Apart from that, we want to also be, uh, you know, creating a video portfolios. So EBC Learning, our studio is very nearby. We are just five kilometers from here, right? And also, if some of the student wants to come over at our office, we have a learning center. So if you want to just uh, sit around, chill, access other materials uh, of EBC, uh, talk to me, talk to Abhinandan or other people who are there in the office. Uh, generally about any other queries and issues that you are surrounding about some sort of a career guidance uh, if you are at a point in your law school where is uh, you are a little lost which I call it generally a law school midlife crisis right and if you really need some sort of a support in terms of that okay what do we do how to go about it next right because sometimes five year can be a really really daunting uh, task right um, so that's about it uh, in terms of the nature and uh, the working of the course, right? Uh, otherwise, uh, if you have like any doubts, uh, questions, uh, queries, etc. about the course or in general about EBC learning, what we do, how we do, uh, we are here on campus for uh, at least few hours. So we'll be hanging around in the lounge or anywhere inside the campus you can catch hold of me abhinandan or whoever is available right so that's about it from my side thank you for your invitation i am actually interested in pursuing a career in corporate law and with i haven't had any uh, corporate internship as of yet but I want to go in for that and explore that side as well. And I think today's class was a good introduction to insolvency law. I haven't studied that yet. And this course, I think, would be a great help to pursue that in a manner. Yeah. Right. Um, thank you <laughs> for the appreciation. But uh, another thing is that, like, so a lot of you may be in the same problem that, uh, or facing in the sense that you want to build a career in corporate law, but never had the exposure to a corporate law firm, right? For that, uh, as you could have seen in the previous slide, we do provide 100% placement assistance. That is not just only placement, but also internship assist, uh, you know, assistance. So while you are, you know, doing the course or after the course or, you know, duration of it, so we have uh, some of the placement partners, internship and placement partners listed. So, and a lot of them are also coming and delivering this course and teaching you. So uh, it would be a great opportunity if you are taking this course, one of those people may think, oh, this person is quite bright enough, quite, you know, on to the task, right? And they could take a queue up for the internships and later on that would, you know, result in, uh, in, in PPOs, right? So that would be, uh, you know, as an added 
you know benefit because we do believe in providing you again the comprehensive and the you know rigorous uh, training uh, to things. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the fees for the course is uh, eighty five thousand, right, for uh, the six months. And uh, you, if you're a Bennett student, uh, you don't have to pay for the hostel because you're already uh, stationed here, so the classes would happen here. So you'll have uh, the course would run for six months, and you would have access, uh, as I said before, access to uh, the cases on SEC online. You'd have access to somewhere around twenty books on EBC Reader. Uh, that you can see, and all the video materials and also the live recordings. So fees would be eighty-five thousand. And as of now, there's an early bird offer, so you can, uh, you know, so there's some reduction. So try to log in as soon as possible.